as MVP, I'm known all around the world by people who are fans of professional wrestling and because of that, other avenues as well. I am this guy. Pretty cool, United States champion. Uh, actually, back then, as you could see, I had cornrows. Good time. Traveled the world, made money, had some incredible experiences. But before I was this guy, I was this guy. Number 190197, Florida Department of Corrections. Florida State, DOC. I'm from Miami. And when I was a kid, a teenager, I made a lot of very bad decisions. I was involved with gangs, guns, violent crime, robbery, shootings. And as a result of those decisions, I ended up with an 18 and a half year prison sentence with a mandatory three, meaning I had to serve three years before I could earn any time off for good behavior. 18 and a half years, of which I served nine and a half. Now, when I went to prison, I knew that one day I was gonna get out. So I had to do everything that I could to better myself as much as I could. I read voraciously. I took whatever classes were available. And unfortunately, in the Department of Corrections, there's not a whole lot of correcting going on. A lot of warehousing. There aren't enough educational programs and enough uh, training, vocational training, for everyone, sadly enough. And there's a saying in prison, don't serve the time, make the time serve you. And I did that to the best of my ability. And when I got out, the first thing I had to do was look for a job. And fortunately for me, I, I had family. So I had a place to live, and, and I, I had a support structure in place. But just before I got out, I met a professional wrestler, a man named Daryl Davis, who in many ways I credit for saving my life, because he introduced me to professional wrestling. And that was a path that I took. And I decided to train to become a professional wrestler. But while I was doing that, I was out looking for a job. And every place that I went denied me a job because I was a convicted felon. Let me tell you about one particular incident where I went to a call center. And there was about, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen people and they had these computer terminals set up and everyone had to take this skills, aptitude type test. And when we finished, the administrator came out absolutely raving, just fawning over me because she said that I scored the highest score on that test that they had ever seen. She's talking to me about a managerial position and, and a future with the company. And then she asked me to wait and she stepped away. A few minutes later she came back and her demeanor towards me changed drastically. She wasn't raving and fawning anymore. She asked me to step in another room and wait there. And then two men came and they said <clears throat> that the policy of that particular company was, what, was that they didn't hire convicted felons. So I wouldn't be working there. And then they escorted me off the property. No job. Well, <clears throat> because of the fact that uh, I grew up in streets of Miami and gangs, and I mean, I did spend 10 years in prison. You kind of learn how to look after yourself. I took my talents, like LeBron James, to South Beach, except I wasn't playing basketball. I worked as a bouncer, where I was able to eventually work my way into a position where I was running security at some of the most exclusive, hottest nightclubs on South Beach. And I even did bodyguard work for some world-famous celebrities. But all the while, I was training to become a professional wrestler. And eventually, through lots of hard work, I created an opportunity for myself. And Vince McMahon, owner of the WW World Wrestling Entertainment, he gave me an opportunity. Society wouldn't give me an opportunity to earn minimum wage. But Vince McMahon said, I see something in you. We're going to take a chance. And even though he knew about my criminal background, he said, I'm going to give you a chance. And before I knew it, I was an international wrestling superstar. 
kids playing with my action figures, video games, my face on the side of trucks and billboards, and me 30 feet tall in Times Square. It was amazing. But I never forgot where I came from. I was still, and am still, a convicted felon. However, I used my platform as much as I could to try to change the fate of some other people. I used to go to, ju and I still do, go to juvenile detention centers to talk to at-risk youth and, and work with uh, convicted felons, convicts, to show them that if you work really, really hard, that you can overcome the obstacle of being a convicted felon and you can make a life for yourself. But you got to work really hard. And I discovered that because even when I was MVP, WWE superstar, there was a conversation about making me the world heavyweight champion. And then there were reservations because there were some countries that I still couldn't be admitted to. So potentially, I was still paying my debt to society. I mean, the whole concept is, if you're convicted of a crime and you're sentenced to do time, you pay your debt to society, and then when you get out, you're supposed to have a clean slate. But I found that when you're a convicted felon, paying that debt to society is kind of like paying off student loans. You never stop paying. That's with you for the rest of your life. Canada. Canada is very strict about who they allow to cross their border. And through the WWE law offices, there was a process in place that cost me thousands of dollars. Lots of character witnesses writing letters and, and background checks. But eventually, they gave me some documents, or actually a letter, that says I'm rehabilitated. So anytime I travel to Canada, and I go to the border, I present my passport, and I present my letter of rehabilitation, and they let me in. But unfortunately, society here in the United States, they don't issue you a letter of rehabilitation. You still wear that scarlet letter. Let me throw some numbers at you. There are approximately 2.2 million people in the United States incarcerated in jails and prisons. And there's a distinction to make there. Jail and prison are not the same. I have people that come to me and say, man, you spent 10 years in jail? No, I spent almost 10 years in prison. Jail is where you go until you're convicted and then you're sent to serve your time in prison. 2.2 million. The United States incarcerates more of its citizens than any other country in the world. Every year, Roughly 600,000 people are released from prison. You've got, at any given time, give or take, these numbers are a bit fluid, but 20 million citizens, 20 million citizens that are unincarcerated convicted felons. So there is a segment of our population, a minority group, if you will, that it is legal to discriminate against. Let me show you. If you submit a lease application for an apartment complex or a house or whatever the case may be, they can't deny you based on the grounds of your race, your religion, your political affiliation. That's against the law. But if you've been convicted of a felony, they can deny you housing. Job interview. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Background check. If it pops up, they can deny you a job because you've been convicted of a felony. Now, I'm not unreasonable. I understand, and it's sensible that you might have some reservations about someone who's been to prison for a, you know, a crime of some sort. But I ask you, if you go to prison and you serve your time, and you've paid your debt to society, when do you stop paying? When, is a, when does a murderer get to stop being a murderer? 
If you commit a murder and you go to prison and you serve 20 years and you get out and you stay out and you don't get in trouble again, are you still a murderer? Am I still an armed robber? When is enough enough? So I'm often intrigued by this because here in the United States, we have a problem with recidivism. Depending on whose numbers you look at, the recidivism rates are as low as 47% or as high as 76%. Meaning that the majority of people who go to prison end up going back to prison. Now let's look at some of the reasons why. We have a huge population of people who are imprisoned because they're drug addicts. So instead of treating people who have an addiction, a sickness, we turn them into criminals and we put them in prison. We don't give them the treatment that they need. We don't give them any training. And then we put them back out on the street. Their addiction calls, they reoffend. I can tell you from personal experience, the overwhelming majority of people who get out of prison don't want to go back. Most people want to get a job and get on with their life. They want to start a family or be reunited with their family. They want to be upstanding, tax-paying members of society. But many of them, we don't give them that opportunity. Background check. You're a convicted felon. You can't find a job. You can't find housing. So what do you do? You survive the best way you know how. What would you do? And I'll throw this in there because sometimes people think, well, you should have stayed out of trouble. Shouldn't have gone to prison. Okay, I'll grant you that. But I like to throw this at people sometimes too. Have you ever had a drink and then climbed behind the wheel of your car and drove? Have you ever had a few? When I was in prison, I met a number of guys who, unfortunately, vehicular manslaughter. That one shot, that one extra beer, and their life was changed, and so was the life of the person that they affected. But they were, a, one guy was a dentist. He's not going to prison for anything. But that cocktail party, boom, changed his life. Anybody can get in trouble at any given time, unfortunately. But the question is, if you do, how do you pay your debt to society? When do you get a chance to have a clean slate? How long do you get treated as a second-class citizen? Recently, I sold my home, and I've got some things up in the air, so I decided, well, I don't want to buy another house yet. I'm going to rent until I decide what I want to do and where I want to go. So I told my real estate agent, show me a few places. We looked around. I submitted a lease application with a non-refundable fee. Background check. For a crime I committed when I was 16 years old. I'm 45 now, so we're talking nearly 30 years ago. Background check. Lease application denied. And my fund wasn't refunded. Uh, my fee wasn't refunded. All right. Th that happens. Second lease application. Background check. Denied. Third lease application. Denied. I'm MVP, man. I'm on TV. Your kids play with my action figures. I'm on video games. I've been in movies. No, nothing. I, I go to prisons, and, and, I, and I give talks to prisoners. I work with at-risk youth. I have done everything that I possibly can to show you that, like Canada says, I'm rehabilitated. But unfortunately, a segment of society still sees me as a potential threat. So when John or Jane Doe, who are being released from prison, when they get out, they're not MVP. 
Maybe they can't run fast or jump high or tell a funny joke or throw a ball. Or, but maybe they're really good at data entry. Or maybe they're a really good carpenter or any other number of jobs that they would potentially be denied because of a bad decision that they made at one point in their life. When do you stop paying? I'd like, I would like for you, as you leave here tonight, to ask yourself that question, to have that discussion with your friends, with your colleagues. Would you take a chance and hire a convicted felon and give he or she an opportunity to prove that they're rehabilitated? Or would you go, ah, yeah, they stole some money one time, or they you know, were selling drugs at one point, or yeah, he beat a guy up in a bar, yeah, we're not, yeah, we're not gonna take a chance on him. I would like to think that everybody here can see both sides of the argument, but express, I don't know, maybe some empathy? Because even though to some people I'm a celebrity, to some people I'm Montel Vontavious Porter, I'm MVP, to some juvenile delinquents who have come to me and said, hey man, I saw you when you came to my my detention center, and man, you, what you said made me change. To the convicts who have gotten out of prison, who found me and said, dude, you, you inspired me so much. To them, I'm MVP. But sadly, to the people that own those homes that wouldn't rent to me, to the countries that won't allow me in, I'm not MVP. I'm still number 190197. I'm an ex-convict. I'm just a convicted felon. Thank you very much for listening to my TEDx talk. <laughs>